Welcome everyone to MRO is faster when you know what's there and what it's doing. I'm Carmen Eck, Marketing Manager with Regal, and I'm gonna be your moderator for today. Now, if you're not familiar with who Regal is, um, you probably are familiar with one or more of our many brands. Um, that includes Sealmaster Bearings, Miguel Camp Followers, System Plus, Conveying Components, and Grove Gear, uh, gearboxes, and, and many other brands as well. So we have a great session in store for you today. Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be with be here with us today. Um, we're happy to have you, and um, I think you're going to really enjoy uh, this presentation. Okay, so let's pull up um, our presenters, and then we'll get to our panelists, and we'll get you introduced to the team here today. Um, so first, I'm going to start with Dan Phillips. I'm going to turn Dan's camera on, and his mic is now live. Uh, Dan, uh, welcome. Thanks for being here today. If you could just give us a, a brief overview of who you are and uh, where you're located. Sure. Yeah, Dan Phillips. I have responsibility for our Connected Services Group within Regal here, located in Florence, Kentucky, and been with the company for about 15 years. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for being here. Okay, I'm going to move over to Peter Mills. Uh, Peter, let's get your camera on here. Your mic is live, and uh, tell us a little about yourself and where you're located. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. Peter Mills here, Regional Sales Director for the Great Lakes region uh, within Regal PCS, based out of Indianapolis. Been with uh, Regal since uh, September 2017, so going on four years here. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks. thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Peter. Okay, and then our panelists, pull up Rob. There you are, Rob. Introduce yourself, hey, please. Hey, good afternoon. Um, Rob Fuller here, um, product manager in the Perceptive Connected Services Group. Been with the company about 22 years. Looking forward to talking with you this afternoon. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for being here. Hey, and I'm going to move over to Caitlin. Caitlin, you're live. Tell us a little about yourself and where you're located. I'm Caitlin Strasberger. I'm the district manager for Cincinnati North. Um, and I've been with Regal in a few different roles um, be four years this December. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. So glad to have you here with us today. Happy to be here. Um, let's talk about why the topic of MRO being faster when you know what's there and what it's doing. Let's talk about why that's relevant. Um, you know, why is it a problem if the maintenance team doesn't know what's there and they aren't really sure about the health of their equipment? Um, you know, why is that a problem for them and why is it relevant for us to be talking about that today? Yeah, I think that's uh, especially relevant today, Carmen, and thanks for the cat uh, question and, and kicking it off. Um, you know, if we even step back and think of ourselves as consumers, um, you know, we expect products and services to be purchased easily. Uh, we expect those transactions to be really seamless. And, uh, you know, even when we order things online, we expect them to you know, show up within two days. Um, and I think it's gotten really to a point where once we found a company that reliably provides that ease of business and that level of service, we generally don't shop around a whole lot. So if you relate that back to the infrastructure that's needed to provide that level of service to a customer, you know, you think about the equipment and the logistics that are, that are involved in making that happen. Um, suppliers really can't afford to be down unexpectedly. Um, you can't throw warm bodies at the problem uh, to try to make up ground. Um, especially today in a, in a really competitive labor market. So when you think about the you know industrial facilities, whether that's a production facility, whether that's a distribution center, it's it's really important to be proactive with maintaining the assets in those facility uh, in that facility because you know ultimately they're they're responsible for producing revenue for the company. And a large large part of that, Carmen, like you said, is the is the MRO process, the maintenance, repair, and operations process. Um, that's something that we widely use to describe uh, various activities associated with um, keeping a facility up and running, and uh, that's what we'll get into and, and discuss today and figure out how we can uh, how we can improve that. Thanks, Dan. Sounds fantastic. Okay, so let's go to that first slide, uh, Peter, and we'll go, go through the roadmap for today. Um, Dan's going to actually talk more about the maintenance, repair, and operations process give you that full view of all the different details that that um, encompasses. Um, he's also going to get into the high cost of MRO as well as some hidden costs that you might not even be that you might not have even thought of before. 
Um, Dan, as well as Peter, also have a few case studies to share with you. Um, the MRO um, is faster when you know it's there, what it's doing, um, leads us to what we've just recently launched, which is the Tag It program. And we have customers using that today, so we're excited to share with you those case studies and um, give you some insight into you know, how we can make the MRO process faster. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about monitoring. Um, so if you are a user at your facility and you're responsible for keeping your equipment up and running, um, it's really helpful to know what's going on with that equipment, um, getting some insights um, into the health of those components. Um, so we're, we'll talk more about how monitoring can help you do that as well. So I'm gonna now turn things over to, to Dan Phillips. Um, so with that, Dan, I'm gonna turn things over to you. So if we look at the, the typical MRO process, you know, there, there can be a lot of steps needed to complete that. If you start at the, you know, the 12 o'clock position there where you've got a, a unit in use and move clockwise to the point where you know that it needs to be replaced, um, there could be a lot of time involved um, in doing that. A lot of the complexity, um, certainly plenty of room for error, and um, all those are things that can ultimately cut into production time, time and uh, really increase cost uh, unnecessarily. Um, so I think we have next year kind of as, as, uh, as we go through as a quick polling question uh, for the audience here to think about you know, when you're looking at this diagram here and, and thinking about how your facility typically goes through um, the MRO process and, and trying to understand what are some of the most time consuming elements of that, of that process. Um, you know, think about that and we'll, we'll do a live poll here and, and start to, to get some feedback on that. Great, thanks Dan. And the question that we're asking today is, you know, what's the most time consuming element of the MRO process for you and your team? Is it identifying parts? You know, maybe you've got a large facility with some hard to reach areas and, you know, just to change out a gearbox that might be 30 to 40 feet in the air, you've got to get up there and identify it first. Um, you know, is it looking for parts? Do you have a lot of inventory in your storeroom and, and maybe you even have a goal to, you know, kind of trim that down and make it more streamlined? but it's time consuming. Um, or is it um, ordering the right part? You know, sometimes, you know, there's people that go out, go around and figure out the parts that need to be um, reordered because, you know, it's time to replace them. Um, and that needs to be passed off to the purchasing person. But hey, there's some um, issues sometimes with writing those down correctly. And now the purchasing person needs to, you know, really hunt down the right part before they place it on order. Um, or is it waiting for those long lead time parts? Maybe you've got something that's pretty critical, but it takes two to three weeks for that special item or that custom gearbox or a non-stocked bearing or gearbox to come in, um, and you got to wait on that part. Is that a time-consuming um, time-consuming piece that really causes some headaches? Um, so again, looking for some feedback from from everybody on the line here on the most time-consuming elements of the MRO process for you and your team. Um, and again, that polling bar is over to the right-hand side of the screen. You want to be looking for the icon with three vertical bars. Um, Dan, it's looking like we've got some uh, responses that have come in here. And um, it's 50-50 on the top two. So identifying parts um, is costing people some time. And looking for parts is also uh, costing some time. So that seems to be what is uh, the group here on the phone is, is really finding to be uh, time consuming. Sure, yeah, I think identifying parts, especially when you put that, that qualifier in there, Carmen, about the, the hard to reach area, you, know, you think about having to get up on, you know, scissor lifts, man lifts, et cetera, potentially to, to go read a nameplate for a you know, replacement part, that can certainly be a, a time consuming um, aspect of the, the whole process. Mm -hmm. And then just looking for parts, you know, certainly we've, we've dealt with um, um, helping folks out that, you know, have inventory that, you know, may not be readily available in the storeroom or maybe there's multiple locations where that inventory is. So really just trying to find the, the physical component, you know, certainly see how that would be a, a relevant um, relevant response here and, and uh, one of the one of the more popular ones as well. So appreciate everybody um, taking that poll. It's always always interesting to see the res these results and, and really like to do the, the live polls throughout this to keep it interactive. So thank you for uh, participating in that for sure. Um, some other, you know, thought-provoking questions here. You know, we, as you look at that that diagram um, of the MRO process, the nine or so steps that are, are generally involved in that. Um, you know, that last poll is meant to, you know, figure out which of those components within that process, which one of those pieces of that process was the most time-consuming. 
Um, here's some other thought-provoking questions to think about. You know, how, how can we quantify the costs associated with that, with those more time-consuming elements um, in the MRO process? I think first and foremost, obviously, we need to think of, of our customers, um, how they're affected, um, understand you know, how these things are, are tied to a facility's production metrics. Are they tied to it effectively, um, et cetera? I think ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, all these little things that we do uh, through this process, um, you know, whether it's looking for those parts, identifying the replacements, um, you know, the purchasing process in general, um, maybe there's an alternate component that you're trying to evaluate if it's going to fit and work in your application. All those little things that, that sometimes we, we overlook really start to add up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see next year a result of, of the poll that was included in the, uh, in the registration process for this webinar, uh, which is really aimed at kind of quantifying the amount of time in, in this particular example to replace a, a motor or a gearbox. Um, so Carmen or Peter, if you guys would, would pull that up, I'd appreciate it. So again, this was a poll that was included throughout the, the registration process for the webinar. You know, on average, how long does it take to replace a, a motor and gearbox in the facility? Um, the largest category there was the, the two to four hour mark, um, which is something that you know certainly resonated with me when I saw the result, these results because that was a, a very similar response to um, some of the other facilities that we worked with. Um, but there's also a, a pretty significant amount, um, over 50%, that's taking over a day um, to replace that. And you know, that could be because it's in a hard-to-reach area. That could be that the, the lead time on these things is, is longer. Um, a lot of things that can, can add up to that process. But think of being down 50% or more people being down for a day or longer um, uh, because of that simple motor gearbox. That's, a, that's pretty significant. So um, really interesting to see the, the results of the registration process here. So Peter, if you, if you go to the, the next slide there, you know, thinking about how we can compress that MRO cycle uh, throughout the webinar when, when I wrap up here, um, Peter and, and Caitlin and Rob are, are going to talk about how to start to reduce this process. So the, the image on the left there is what we saw earlier in the, in the presentation of our standard MRO cycle uh, that we go through. And we wanted the audience here to start to think about you know, for those two to four hours of downtime or maybe those those multiple days of downtime that you're experiencing from just a simple motor or gearbox replacement, um, what those hours cost and then what would the effect of simplifying that process be and really even to some degree automating that process. Um, if you can reduce that time by, by 20 or even 30 percent, um, it can be some pretty significant savings and efficiency there. So uh, the next case study we have in the, in the next slide here really starts to um, dive into that and helps to understand how these little things start to end up, uh, add up over the course of uh, the weeks and the month, weeks and months. Um, so this facility here, um, distribution warehouse, um, this facility here had many of the same challenges um, that this audience um, had identified as well. You know, determining what replacement parts were needed uh, when the equipment wears out. Um, certainly in this case, too, being subjected to unplanned outages or, or maybe extended uh, outages while you're, you're waiting for components to, um, to arrive at your facility. Um, so these really are not unique challenges to either a you know, distribution warehouse like this or, or other production facilities. Um, but as a solution to these challenges, uh, this facility implemented an asset management program, uh, which helps their users, helps their associates, um, their team members easily identify parts. Um, identify their physical location and really make the, the replacement and the ordering process much more seamless. And all those things are ultimately aimed at reducing that overall cycle time uh, for MRO. Now, in this facility, too, they should mention they also had some uh, what we call critical assets. So um, these are assets or, or pieces of, of equipment that, if they were to fail, would really cause some major headaches to production, um, maybe even potentially create safety risks in the facility. So for those assets, they were, were taking it one step further and using uh, sensor technologies to identify uh, issues very early in the progression. And ultimately, that, that allows them to plan and schedule uh, the maintenance as opposed to the equipment uh, scheduling them. So with the target solution that, that Peter and Caitlin are going to get into in, in more depth here, um, at the end of the day, this facility is able to reduce their, their MRO process time on average from three hours uh, down to two hours. Um, and when you extrapolate that out, 
um, to include the number of replacements that they go through a year. They're saving over two and a half billion dollars a year, year over year. I mean, that's that's just remarkable. So again, it just really speaks to the power of how these little things in this cycle really add up. And we're again able to uh, reduce that cycle by 20 or 30 percent. There's some significant dollars that can be saved as a result of that. So I think Peter, the next slide is a, another poll that we did throughout the uh, the registration process here. Um, if you want to bring that up, um, you know, speaking more to the the unplanned downtime um, and how often uh, facilities are are experiencing that. So one thing that jumped out here to me was that you know, aside from that that eight percent there, that's that must be some very best practice top performers that that never experienced unplanned downtime. You know, over ninety percent. Um, of facilities and, and respondents reported here that they're experiencing downtime, unplanned downtime, at least once per week. That that was definitely more than I had had expected when when we initially created this poll. But again, you know, this is something that you know, people are dealing with um, every week. Um, again, that really starts to add up in terms of the the labor costs and the potential production losses. As well. So I, I thought that was a, a really uh, really telling story. If you go to the next uh, infographic there, Peter, I think as you look at this kind of in aggregate you know, as a whole across um, across industrial manufacturers, um, you know, as the graphic there says, that's costing uh, $50 billion annually. Um, you know, I know with, especially when we talk about government spending, we throw the, the billions and trillions around a lot and I have a good grasp of how much money that is, but $50 billion is certainly a, certainly a big chunk of change. Um, especially when you think of, of Almost half of that, 40% of that downtime, downtime uh, due to equipment failures, um, definitely significant. And those failures are, are the result of a number of things, maybe aging equipment, poorly maintained equipment, things like operator errors, really a multitude of causes. Really what we're seeing more and more of is, is facilities that are looking to mitigate these losses. Um, we're seeing an increase in what we call condition monitoring. And that is the, the use of technologies to determine uh, the health of an asset so you can start to see faults or degradation in that before it becomes more catastrophic and ultimately fails to, fails to function. So again, we're seeing an increase in these technologies, I, I think largely because just sensors in general are, are more readily available now than really any time before. Um, you know, in our personal lives, you know, like we see censored or, or smart products just about everywhere now. Um, and that's really because of the way that, that we are, are starting to interact with things, not just with, with each other, but um, with physical, um, physical, physical assets too, you know, because of the, because of the smartphone. Um, so it's, it's neat to see um, you know, how a lot of those technologies are now being applied more readily and more uh, frequently to, to the industrial space as well. So if you go on the, the next slide up, Peter, is a really good case study there. Um, a simple case study as to how a brewery facility here is using um, online or 24-7 monitoring um, to, uh, to look at the health of their boiler feed water pumps. And a boiler feed water pump is generally something that we refer to as a, as a plant utility. Um, so it's an asset that really is keeping the production floor running. The pump that's supplying water to a boiler which then supply steam to the facility. A similar type of utility assets could be chilled water, compressed air, those types of things. A lot of times they're, they're out of sight, out of mind. Um, this facility here didn't have um, you know, redundant equipment, having a, a redundant spare right next to it's rather expensive. Um, the lead time for replacement parts or spare parts um, was pretty extensive and, and trying to keep all those spare parts within stores uh, wouldn't have been very cost effective as well. So facility was really looking for a way to know in advance of any problems that they would have to address. Um, so in this case here, they're using uh, wireless vibration and temperature sensors, uh, which are mounted directly to the equipment. And those are kind of listening to the equipment, you know, obviously looking at the heat as well in order to uh, detect faults that were in the equipment. Um, so that again, they can plan and schedule the work accordingly. Um, this is a case here that we have some more information on our website, but we're able to detect some misalignment uh, between the two shafts there, between the motor and the pump shaft, um, which is ultimately going to start damaging uh, the bearings and the seals. Um, the nice thing about this technology in, in this case here, too, is that we're able to, to do this remotely as opposed to having to go out there, um, collect data with a phone or collect data with 
you know, an additional uh, additional portable analyzer or something, uh, we can see this remotely and and work with the maintenance crew uh, to be able to to apply that corrective ash, action in a, in a really efficient manner, um, which ultimately ultimately led to a savings of hundred thousand dollars in lost production, um, but also helped to to prolong to prolong the uh, life of the equipment there. So really interesting case study, and again things that we're starting to see more and more of um, the use of these types of technology. Hey, Dan. Can yes, ma'am. Uh, interrupt you for just one moment. Uh, we just had a question come in, and I'd like to bring up um, our panelist, uh, Rob Fuller, to answer it. I know that he was um, actually at this facility, and he helped with this install. So, Rob, sure. let me turn your camera and mic on here. I'll, I'll read you the question. Maybe you've already seen it, but just in case you haven't. Uh, you there, Rob? Yep. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. So um, in this situation here, if the boiler feed pump was inspected regularly, why was the issue missed? Okay. Yeah, that's um, uh, an observant question. There, I see the there is a bullet there that, that uh, points out that the maintenance team was inspecting regularly, which was the case. This, this particular facility had a very good maintenance uh, team. They took pride in what they, they do, and they did check their equipment, they do check their equipment regularly. But I think the answer to this question really, I think it, I think it really highlights the value of the monitoring piece um, because what they were doing and what they typically do, and I think this is um, typical of many maintenance staffs, um, they, they walk around, they like to know their equipment, um, they listen, they look, they feel, um, but really it kind of, it kind of gets down to the definition of the word problem in this case uh, and the timing of it. The, the maintenance staff was, was checking and they were looking and listening, but the, the real issue was at a, at a much earlier stage, so they couldn't detect what the, the monitoring system could detect. Um, so we were, we were able to detect the, the problem at a much earlier stage than what, than what you could hear with your ear or see with your eyes. Typically, if it gets to that point where you can, you know, you can see it or hear it, it's typically a pretty um, advanced problem at that point. Maybe even to the point of damaging the equipment or breaking down. So, to really, they didn't detect it because they were just looking and and and, and listening. But with the uh, sensors in place, we were able to pick it up at a at a much earlier stage, and then therefore uh, alert them to the situation. That they were able to to fix that before there was a major problem. Okay, great. Thanks, Rob, for that detailed explanation. And I can I can certainly see how this would be of value, um, especially Dan mentioned that it's a longer lead time item. Um, early detection allowed them to get the part on, on order sooner, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. This was um, a, a pump that would take weeks to get, so definitely saved them a lot of downtime. Great, okay, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Over back to you, Dan. I think this last infographic kind of sums up the, the predictive maintenance condition monitoring piece pretty well um, in terms of being able, an effective tool for reducing that unplanned downtime. The, the previous results from the registration poll were, you know, on average, a lot of folks were spending two to four hours of, of uh, time replacing stuff and, and over 50% of respondents were spending more than a day or two um, on this stuff. So if you think of um, utilizing these technologies to, to almost cut that amount of time in half, um, that's, that's pretty substantial. Um, you know, when you think about, again, the, the labor savings and the, and the production losses that could result in that amount of time. And then the other piece of this, like the case study highlighted too, is, is being able to prolong the equipment life. Um, so not running it to failure, especially when it's a, a critical asset, uh, being able to prolong that equipment life to you know, negate uh, spending CapEx to replace it, um, that really starts to provide a positive um, uh, way of looking at uh, total cost of ownership, a really positive impact for it. Um, the other piece that we're seeing here, you know, related to downtime is that, quote unquote, zero unplanned downtime is, if not the number one, a very high priority within industrial facilities. Um, that makes sense when you think about it. You know, there's, a, there's a need to be able to compete globally. Um, and ensure that customer demand is being met. So again, um, eliminating as much unplanned downtime as, as possible is, is key. Um, and in many cases, what we're seeing too is that it's, it's as much of a, of a focus as uh, safety is too in industrial facilities. 
Um, the interesting thing there is that there, there are a lot of correlations um, between liability and safety as well. They're, they're definitely um, interrelated. Um, if you think about, you know, you know from a, a reactive standpoint, scrambling around to, to get equipment back up and running when it goes down unexpectedly, you probably didn't have the time to plan out each step. Um, and inherently doing that type of work is more risky um, as opposed to being able to properly uh, scope, plan, and, and schedule those activities. So I think safety is definitely a, another piece that um, needs to be included in here as well. And um, um, all things considered, I think you know, the predictive maintenance condition monitoring again, became becoming much more prevalent in industrial facilities. But um, I'll turn it over to you, Peter, uh, really get into some of the details of the, the Daggett program. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, Dan, for, for really setting the table on the, the overall MRO process, how complex it can be, um, and then also the, the condition monitoring side of things. And, you know, the benefits, some, you know, really setting the table on, on some of the benefits of, you know, how a facility might be in, in a reactive maintenance mindset and, and tr getting to the proactive maintenance mindset, which obviously we'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about here in, here in a few slides. Um, before we kick it off and, and really talk about, talk about how the TAGIT program works, uh, we've got a, a brief video that talks about a success story at, at one of our customers. So I'll, I'll kick it over to Carmen to, to show that video and we'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll be right back with you. How many times have you had difficulty in getting the right parts in at the right time to maintain a safe and productive operation? How much time do you spend looking for spares in your inventory, calling suppliers or manufacturers? What would the impact to your facility be if you could standardize and streamline your MRO inventory? The whole idea behind Tagit was to help facilities streamline their inventory and cut down on their actual SKUs. It's really evolved to something even more than that with making ordering product much easier as well as knowing exactly what they're supposed to do replacements with. So before they even go out onto the floor to do the maintenance, they know exactly what they have to bring with them to cut down on their maintenance time as well as the downtime in their facilities. We have so many different styles of conveyors and gearboxes, motors. Streamlining reduces the amount that we have to keep on the shelf. We can uh, replace them quicker, not have to carry as heavy of an inventory, which keeps our costs down. Still will help with identifying the units. It will help with uh, minimizing, I would say, discrepancies in employees writing down what it is that they need. So they can scan it now and it gives me the information versus a person may or may not have wrote down the right information. The reason why we started trying to do this is because of manpower. Well, we had to go to the machine, we had to test amperages, we had to test uh, for heat, went to monitoring where you sit behind a computer and you pull up the uh, the graphs, charts, and so forth, and it tells you exactly what you would have saw if you went up there physically. Our building is quite large, and for me to walk down there versus me sitting behind a computer at the moment and pushing a few buttons, Save tremendous time. When you guys put the first nodes on, I should say, within the first week we had a motor have problems. Um, of course, you guys are doing the monitoring right now, and you contacted us, and you have a motor that's overheating with a lot of vibration. And uh, so we went and looked at it. Over the weekend, we changed that motor out. So that was a very good example of where the nodes will pay for themselves. By the end of the time of getting it up and running, production be back up and running, we could lose anywhere between five to six hours. The cost per, per item goes up because we have to use more manpower instead of using the automatic equipment. When you're doing hundreds of thousands of shoes, that could be a large amount of money. So that comes off your bottom line. So, Knowing a motor is going out early, early warning like with this node system, we can plan this, okay, we got a box, it's getting extremely bad, and during the five hours that they're not running at night shift, my night shift guys could change that out and we lose zero downtime during production hours. Perceptive is a combination of hardware, software, and humanware. It's a new way to interact with all of your Regal products. 
For more information or to find out how Perceptive could benefit your facility, visit Perceptive.com. Excellent story. Such a great, great job, Caitlin, telling us, walking us through that, that process and, and how our customers really, really experienced such a great uh, documented cost savings and, and, you know, increased uptime. Um, you know, before we dive into, again, how the program really works, we got another polling question to kind of pick your brain on, on the pains that you guys are, are experiencing in the MRO and, and maintenance process. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so just ask you to uh, look over to the right side of your screen. Again, you're looking for the icon that has the three vertical poles. Um, it says pole on it. And the question is, what is a primary challenge for you and your team? Is it having enough resources? Uh, streamlining and standardizing inventory? Um, is it meeting production goals? Um, or is it getting components on time? Um, or maybe it's all of these and it's all of the above. Um, so if you would, please uh, go to the right of your screen, find that whole icon, um, just take a moment to answer that question. Um, again, what is a primary challenge for you and your team? Um, is it having enough resources? Is it streamlining and standardizing inventory? Is it meeting production goals? Is it getting components on time? Or is it all of the above? Okay, so uh, Peter, we've got some results in here. 67% uh, of our attendees are saying that having enough resources um, is their biggest challenge, and that's followed by all of the above. So 33% are saying all of the above, and 67% are saying having enough resources, which today's day gotcha. and age, we're hearing a lot of that. So um, yeah. if you want to yeah, go ahead and yeah. comment. No, you're, you're right. We, we are hearing a lot of that. You know. Workforce is, is tough to find these days. Um, finding the right people to do the right job is, is, is definitely tough. Um, and that actually feeds right into to what the TAGIT program is all about, um, you know, from, from the QR codes to the, the condition monitoring. So um, glad to hear that, that you guys are, are, have that same feedback. And um, again, we're, we're hearing the same thing. So, you know, diving into to really how the, the TAGIT program works, it's, it's very simple. In, in its process and, 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 and what, what we're trying to accomplish. You know, going back to what you said as far as manpower, lack of manpower, being able to do the same job with less people, um, you know, that's, again, what, what the TAGIT program is. Um, you know, in three easy steps, we, we can all encompass the, the whole program. The first step really is, you know, Real and our, and our distribution partners team together to come in and, and um, survey your facility of all your drive package assets. And when we're doing that survey, we're cataloging with our, with, I mentioned the uh, QR code, we're, we're sticking a QR code on the asset and, and cataloging all the individual components, whether that's a gearbox, a motor, bearings, uh, we're, we're actually getting into conveyor components, whether that's chains, belts, wear strips, that type of stuff, and, and cataloging all that to and, and, and linking it back to the QR code. So once the survey is complete, you as the customer then can go in with your cell phone that everybody has, that everybody puts it in their pocket when they, when they leave their house and, you know, carries it with them when, when they're at work. You can pull that out. You can scan that QR code in, in our app and it'll pull up all the pertinent information that's, that's associated with that QR code and that, that drive package asset. From there, you can drill down and, and access all the individual components and access interchange information over to Regal Brandon Products. And then we talk about the, the MRO process and taking steps out of it. Right then and there, it has a, a link on where to buy with that distributor partner that, that we've teamed with that you, you already are buying through. It links it to their website, which makes it quick and easy for you to, to then place a PO and, and get that individual component on order right then and there. You know, obviously, if, if you don't have the ability to place that PO, you have the ability within the app to share the, the QR code information with the, the purchasing department, MRO, crib manager, whoever it might needs to be, you know, looped in within the process for then that order to be placed. So really taking steps out of, out of the MRO process for you, making it streamlined for, for you to do business with our distributor partners, for our distributor partners to then do business with us as well. And lastly, you know, I mentioned, you know, being able to, to include the, the condition monitoring side of things. It is, it is an additional um, add-on for, for the condition monitoring 
but being able to, to add that in, on our customer dashboard or on, on a tablet, being able to view the, the asset health associated with your, with your given asset, if you have a, a wireless node or, or a hardwire node included on that asset, and being able to, to really view all of, of, of the, that content in one spot is one thing that, that our competition doesn't offer in, in the marketplace. And really being able to, I mentioned it previously, getting getting ahead of things and, and really going from a reactive maintenance mindset to a proactive predictive maintenance mindset is key and, and really going to be able to, to let you get ahead of problems and, and really reap the rewards of, of the program. And, you know, as, as Dan alluded to, being able to save $100,000 on on one particular application and, and really save 400 barrels of beer, that, that, that resonates great with me. So... Um, you know, obviously, we want to be able to pass that that benefit along to you as as the end customer. So, diving in a little bit more to how the program works and and what the PTS ecosystem app has in store for you, we can walk you through, you know, what the what the app looks like and how how you can interact with it. Um, this video here show, shows Caitlin, you know, obviously scanning scanning a QR code um, with her phone in in the app, and it, it it pulls it up right straight to the the asset level detail um, here, you know, obviously, as, as I said, you scan the QR code, it takes you to the asset level detail, pulls up the enterprise information, so your company name, your site location. Obviously, if, if your company has multiple sites that, that have the, the, the Tagit program in it, um, you know, you would have, you would potentially have the ability to access all those other sites and, and look at all other, you know, asset in, in, information, inventory information as well. Um, and then you're able to, to drill down, as I mentioned earlier, drill down to the component level and, and really view the, the individual components, the individual gearbox, the individual motor bearings, anything that we have associated with that given QR code. And, you know, again, it, it's got the current installed asset or installed component, and then it's got the, the Regal brand and product that interchanged over to, to, you know, what we would be able to offer from an order now standpoint. And then you, as, as you saw on a, on a previous shot there, you, you've got the order now um, information, which um, allows you to place the order right then and there. It links you to, to our distribution partners website and, you know, really takes steps out of the MRO process. Hey, Peter. Yeah. Peter, hi. Before you go to the next uh, slide there, um, there is a question that came in specifically about okay. what you're talking about here. And, I want to bring Caitlin up, um, our panelist Caitlin, to answer that for us. So, Caitlin, let me just turn your your camera and mic on here. And I'll read you the question. Sure. I hear you good. Um, so, Caitlin, you've been doing a lot of these surveys um, for customers. Can you go into some detail? The question here is, how does the Tagit program work in practice for your customers? Sure. So uh, once we've identified at a customer that Tagit is going to be a good fit for them, um, meaning we, we've walked through the facility, we kind of see what they have, um, where they're, they're lacking as far as um, not really knowing what they have and what I like to call their active inventory, so what's actually being used at the time, um, we set up a date uh, that we can get a survey uh, to come in and, and me and um, a lot of times a distributor partner, um, someone from our motors group, uh, we come in, we physically go through your facility and literally uh, tag what you have um, through the app that Peter just showed you. Um, and from there, instantly, um, you can see both on the app and on our online platform, um, all of the information that we're putting in, and um, we have over 18,000 parts just in our motors and gearing, and we continue to add more in our other product groups. Um, that's an instantaneous interchange for you. So like on this uh, slide that Carmen is showing right now, you can see that we've um, changed that tie gear over to a Grove Ironman. Um, and that pops up instantaneously because of all of the data that we have um, already preloaded into the app or onto the website. So it's a pretty quick, uh, pretty quick benefit uh, going through and doing the survey. Great, thanks, Caitlin. And you really spoke to how easy it can be to help streamline, consolidate your inventory by utilizing this tool as a as a help um, in in that activity. So thanks, thanks for walking through that, Caitlin. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Peter, back to you. Sure. Thanks, Carmen. 
So let's, you know, that's, that's the app side of things. And, and obviously pretty straightforward, pretty seamless, very easy to use. You know, there is an app for that. And, and we're trying to make, again, make life easy as possible for, for you to transact with, with us and our distributor partners. Um, hey, let's Peter, go in. Yeah. Before you go to that next one, there is actually another question that popped in here. Um, I would okay. like to bring up Rob and have him answer this next one here. Hey, Rob, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, so Rob, can monitoring be added um, directly to the Tagit program? We've been talking about monitoring, but I think this question is more specific about, can you can you do both? Oh, yeah, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I think the, uh, as Dan and Peter, Caitlin have all shown, it's it's a natural progression to go from an asset management type of situation to a to a um, monitoring and predictive maintenance type of situation. So with you know with that in mind, the software was we designed the software to do that just that very thing. So you can have a tagit program, you can have assets tagged, and also be monitoring them at the same time. And the the app makes it really easy to go between the two. And 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 so the answer short answer is yes, it's very easy to do. Great, thanks, Rob. Okay, for real this time, Peter, back to you. Excellent. So, yeah, diving into to the asset monitoring side of things, um, you know, that that previous slide showed showed Caitlin actually in, installing a node. Uh, sorry, I'm losing the. Uh, there we go. That's the action shot here, but very easy to to really install. Um, we got multiple different variations of of how we adhere. A, a wireless node to the given asset. It really depends on the, the the given application, but we make sure that we're doing it properly. Whether that's drill and drill and tapping, whether that's magnetic, whether that's you know adhesive, um, but making sure that the node is going to going to stay on the application, given stay on the asset based on the the level of vibration, level of 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 heat, whatever whatever the application is really calling for. So keep that in mind as as we're going through this that. We really do have have a solution for for any type of application that that you you might have in in your given facility. Um, diving into the the computer dashboard that you know again you have access to um, ultimately when you sign up for for the the Tagit program and then also when when you sign up for any any uh, given um, uh, sorry any given condi condition monitoring as well. You first log in and, and you go to the enterprise level, which is very similar to the, the app as well. But then you have the, the ability to drill down and, and go to the asset level, whatever asset that, that you're wanting to view um, there on the left-hand side. From there, you know, very similar as far as the type of content that, that uh, you're viewing on the, on the customer dashboard on the asset information side of things. And, you know, pertinent information within the given facility where it's at, um, the, the component information and, you know, where to buy. But then on the second tab that, that you have listed there, you're able to view the, the asset health, the asset monitoring side of things, and really what, what it has in store for you, being able to, to track the, any, any type of event that has happened within the, with that given asset and with that given node. Um, and also, you know, being able to track from day one when it was installed, all the way to current day, you can track and, and figure out what what the history is behind it. it so if you, if you see something spike, you can go back to that given date and and you know you can really dig into what was going on at the facility at that given time, that given day, and figure out if it, if it was a major event that was going on that that can be explained, or if if it really is something that's going on within that given asset that, that needs to be addressed. You know, as you can see on on the the dashboard, we're monitoring vibration, temperature with a triaxial accelerometer, um, where you have the ab ability to, to monitor motor current signature analysis, um, infrared thermography, pork, you know, really, again, going back to my statement previously of, of any solution, we, we can tailor our solution to any type of failure that, that your facility is experiencing based on the application, based on the type of failure that that, that given component might experience. So. Through co communication with with our application engineering team and you know us as and myself and, and my team as a sales force, uh, we can really come up with with the proper solution for you with the condition monitoring and, and the tagit program. Um, so a little bit more about the the condition monitoring and you know what 
what sets us apart, what makes us a, a, a little bit better bell and whistle from some of the other competitors in the marketplace. You know, we, we have the ability to do wired or wireless nodes, depending upon what the application calls for. Sometimes we, we even have a hybrid system that we, we, we have the ability to, to tailor your offer to you based on the application. Um, you know, the 24-7, 365 remote monitoring, you have access to the data all day, every day, whenever you have a Wi-Fi signal or a cell phone signal, you can log in and view the data. I like to joke that, you know, you can have your toes in the sand, having a, having a beer in your hand and, and be able to log in and, and see the, the data that is going on within your given facility. Say you've gotten a, a um, I'm sorry, get, say you've gotten a, a text message or email alert that, you know, something has fallen out of the, the range of acceptable for you. You can log in right then and there and, and view that asset, figure out what's going on with your, your given um, problem child component and, and alert somebody to, to make that make the necessary changes or or again get something on order for you. Truly it is is customizable as as I've alluded to previously, we tailor our offering to you. And then you know based on you know the we have we, we can we can monitor standard assets, critical assets. We you have the ability to go into to the software and and you know really tier tier the the criticality of a given asset to to really truly understand what your what your facility is in need of and and obviously make make the necessary changes accordingly. So, um, Peter, yeah, yes. Yeah, Before we go to the poll question, um, we did get two questions, two more questions come in. So I want to bring okay. up Kate, Caitlin first, answer the first question, and then we'll go to Rob. So Rob, heads up, there's one coming your way here after Caitlin. So let me turn your camera on, Caitlin, get you back up here. Okay, can you hear me, Caitlin? Yep, can you hear me? Yes, you sound good. Great. Um, so, you know, Rob was just talking about monitoring. You know, in your experience, what problem does monitoring solve uh, for the maintenance teams that you've been working with? Yeah, so big one um, is moving from completely reactive uh, maintenance to not just proactive, but predictive maintenance. Um, being able to work when they already have planned downtime um, or, um, you know, also make sure that they have the parts that they need in before they, they can go in and, and fix anything. Um, so it's, it's a huge time saver. It's a big uh, headache saver. Um, but that they also know um, they're not going to be caught off guard. And I think that that's something that everyone looks for just in life. But it's great when it ties into work, right? Yeah, actually, absolutely. Sounds like some good peace of mind. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, Rob, let sure. me pull you up here and we'll uh, feed you the, that question. Let me get to the live here. Okay, uh, Rob, can you hear me? I can. Okay. So the question, this is a, a question about the wireless uh, sensor here. How long does the battery last wireless sensor? Typically the, the battery life on these sensors, the one that's like on the screen is, is about two years. That's, that's, our, that's what I would say the average life is. Uh, there are things like environmental conditions, extreme heat, extreme cold that could, could impact that or you know how if, if we're taking extremely frequent measurements might might impact that but typically about two years and the nice thing nice thing about this particular one we're looking at is it's field replaceable uh, i know that a lot, of, a lot of folks ask ask that as well is this something that we have to when the battery does go bad do we have to send it back to the factory do you know is it, is it do we throw it in the trash but no sensors um, you can replace it right in the field um, with a uh, wrench, you know, a crescent wrench or something that you have there it doesn't take a special, does not take a special tool. And you, these batteries are about $10 and you can get them from a lot of, a lot of online stores. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Welcome. Yeah. So, so we do have one last polling question to ask the audience here. So if you want to go ahead and migrate to the right side of your screen, look for that poll icon against the three vertical bars. Um, and we're curious, are you using monitoring in your plant today uh, to predict issues for critical equipment? And hey, if you're one of our distributors on the phone, you know, think about some of your customers. Are they using monitoring 
today um, in their plants to predict issues for critical equipment. So um, we're just looking for a simple yes or no, um, or hey, maybe it's on some of your equipment, um, or you don't know, and, and that's okay. You certainly can um, you know, find that out. Um, so again, are you using monitoring in your plant today to predict issues for critical equipment? Um, looking for yes, no, um, on some equipment, or you know, maybe you don't know. So uh, Peter, some uh, uh, responses are starting to trickle in here. Um, again, looking to see if you're using monitoring in your plant today to predict issues for critical equipment. And it looks like the majority of the folks on the phone today are that yes, they are using monitoring. That's, that's excellent to hear. Um, you know, I guess my, my challenge to you is, and obviously want to have a conversation with you after the fact, but uh, truly understand what you, what you guys are, are monitoring, what you guys are getting. Is it route-based, web-based? You know, do we have a, a better way of doing things? Um, you know, again, just, just wanted to, to better understand what you got so that we can make sure that you, you know, we, you, you, you hear our, our complete story and make sure we have, have the best solution for you. So. Um, one other thing that, you know, for, for those of you that didn't respond to that, that question, but, but are, are, aren't, aren't maybe doing condition monitoring, you know, Carmen made, made a good point there of, of selling peace, peace of mind. I mean, really getting, getting to the proactive maintenance mindset and, and knowing when something's going to fail and not having to stay up at night wondering if something's going to fail. You, you, you know that you're getting ahead of stuff and being able to sleep peacefully. It, I, mean, I can't. I can't speak to how how much that is worth. So keep that in mind when when ultimately you're 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 thinking about you know the reactive versus proactive maintenance mindset and and really getting ahead of things. So um, you know with that being said, uh, you know wanted to to reiterate to you what what the Tagit program is and, and the condition monitoring offering that that Perceptive has and and we really think that that you know MRO is faster when you know what's there and what it's doing. And I want to thank you guys very much for your time today and, and joining us and letting us talk about about the Perceptive Tagit program and, and our condition monitoring offering. And uh, let us know if you guys have any questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, just again, the, the Q&A box is open. A lot of you have been ans um, asking questions right along, um, but maybe it's still a, a question that's uh, floating around um, in your head. So feel free to go ahead and type that into the Q&A box. Peter, Dan, Rob, and Caitlin, um, they are available to answer any questions that you have. The other thing is maybe you want to have a, a brief conversation, a one-on-one -on -one with one of our perceptive specialists. In the chat box, I've pasted a link. And this link is pretty cool because it takes you to um, our booking tool. And this is very nice, super convenient. Um, you take the link, copy it, and paste it into your uh, browser and it will take you to a calendar and you can pick a time that's convenient for you to schedule 15 minutes to talk to one of us. And um, again, really convenient. It will send you an email uh, and give you a link to a Microsoft Teams meeting, connect you right in with one of our specialists and you can talk specifics about your application, about your plant and maybe even bigger picture, what your goals and objectives are and what you're trying to accomplish because I think that there's a solution here that can help you, um, you know, really tackle, you know, some of those uh, goals and objectives that you and your organization have. So I encourage you, you know, you can even save that link for later. Uh, we're keeping that booking tool is open. It's something we use frequently uh, throughout Regal uh, to connect our customers to our specialists. So um, feel free to copy and paste that link or hang on to it um, and use it later. Um, if you want to get into the specifics with one of our specialists. Um, very uh, easy to use tool. Um, I am not seeing any questions, any new questions come in here. Just doing a double check. So again, um, would really like to thank you so much for your time and participation. Um, everybody um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, this is this has been recorded and we will be sending out the link to um, everybody who attended so they can view it or share it with others. Um, and again, thank you so much for your time and everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Take care.